Okay, uh, good morning. Let's continue to talk about uh, these uh, rest of the lecture four. Now we're gonna talk about the culture media. Uh, hope we can practice in the lab, but I also gonna talk a lot um, in the lab also, and I will draw on the blackboard. Even if we don't have a lab practice, I still gonna draw a lot on the blackboard, okay? So I'll just go over these slides. So first of all, um, bacteria need some carrier to grow, to transport or store, it, typically in the lab. So we need some medium, or we say media. The media, usually it's a solid media, like agar or liquid media, like solutions or semi-solid. When we test the motility of bacteria, we use semi-solid media. So it's solid, liquid, or semi-solid. Now the media must contain the nutrition, can be used for the bacteria or microorganism to grow, but at the same time, Bacteria should not be break down or eat or eat it or can be cannot be eaten by the bacteria. Now, based on the classification, we'll talk about the chemical components, physical nature, and the function. Now, the classification is actually the key points of the this lecture, and also is it is difficult to understand sometimes. So, first of all, Based on the chemical and the physical types of cultural media, we separate them into defined media and the synthetic media. Defined media, which means each chemical has been well described in the formula of the cultural media. Okay, the key point here is all the chemical ingredients. So every time when you see so-called a pepton, a trapton, beef extract, or those is not well defined regarding the chemicals. Those median, all the median, once they ever have trapton, pepton, beef extract, they are called a complex media. Now, most of the media in the lab, they are complex media. So this is the first concept I want to mention. Second, based on the physical nature, the media can be liquid, semi-solid, and solid. And we mentioned the solution is liquid media. Agar is solid media, semi-solid. Usually we're using 5% agar, used to testing the motility of bacteria. We will do this in the lab, and I will show you that. Now, based on the function, we have support media, enriched media, selected media, and differentiated media. Uh, we will talk about these each one by one. So first of all, this is an example of BG11 median for cyanobacteria and this medium for E. coli. This is called, table 7.5 is called the defined media. You can see all these chemicals are well defined. Okay? All these chemicals are well defined. But when you see here, this is a McConkey agar, nutrient broth, tropic soil broth, and the McConkey agar. This is called a complex media because some of the chemicals are not well defined. For example, we have trapton, we have pepton, we have beef extract. Those are not well defined. Okay, so that's a key point. Although they listed on the ingredients as a median, but they are not chemical defined. So that's called a complex media. So we're going to talk a little bit about these components. So pepton, what is pepton? This is a protein resource partially digested and hydrolyzed, which is a hydrolysis of protein that becomes a pepton. Now, what is extracts? That's usually coming from beef or yeast, which is aquatrous extract. Now, what is agar? We know that it's coming from polysaccharide, sulfated polysaccharide. And the bacteria growing there and cannot degradate, which means cannot eat it. Now, agar is very tricky. It will be solidified about 25 to 30 degrees Celsius melted at more than 45 to 50 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's how you need to know about that. 
Okay, well now we're gonna talk about these things. First of all, we're gonna talk about is support median. Let's say tropic soil agar, TSA. This is a typical support median, which means every bacteria, most of the microorganisms can grow there. Okay, let's say E. coli, Salmonella, Listeria, Cedomonas, Bacillus, they all can grow. But be careful, what type of the bacteria is not gonna grow on the support media? Let's say Haemophilus influenzae, those fastidious bacteria. Those bacteria are very picky, they're not gonna grow. So support media, support many microorganisms to grow, most of them, but not all of them. Okay, based on the support media, we will add 5% sheep blood. So the TSA, tropic soil agar, if we add 5% sheep blood, then this becomes blood agar. Now blood agar, because of there is have 5% sheep blood, so it becomes very, re very red, and you know the blood has a high amount of the nutrition. So it is called enriched media, which means they can support the bacteria to grow dramatically. Okay, that's called the enriched media. Now, what is called the selective media? Selective media, which means in the media, there is some of the ingredients will only favor a certain bacterial grow and inhibit most of the other bacterial grow. That is called the selective media. So this is like when you apply, go to WVU Medical School. Does not mean everybody can go. There is a requirements for GPA. There are the requirements for the uh, essay writing, requirements for the interview behavior. Those are the uh, conditions for selective. You go to WVU Medical School, same as a bacteria for the media. Okay, now the last one, which is called differentiated media. What means differentiated media? Which means based on the biochemistry reaction on the agar, we can different different type of the bacteria. Basically is the color change or the morphology of the colonies. Okay, so I get, but, but here is something which is difficult is, one bacteria median is not gonna be individual, belonging to one certain category. Most of the time, they are belonging to more than two or three categories, so which is a good combination. So for example, I gave an example for you. This is a blood agar. Blood agar is in, in rich media, no problem, because 5% sheep blood. But when you see the colony here, you see the transparent zone, you see some of the not transparent zone, some of the green, a greenish color there. This is also a differentiated media because these transparent zone, we call it beta hemolytic, completely lysis blood cell but all of these greenish color, we say it's alpha hemolytic, which means it's incomplete hydrolysis blood cell. Okay, now here's something else I wanna mention. This guy looks like brownish, looks like a chocolate. Okay, so we call it chocolate agar, but be careful, chocolate agar, there is no chocolate there. This is 5% sheep blood agar heated at 70 degrees Celsius, then the color will turn brownish. So we call it chocolate agar, which is should say chocolate-like agar. There is no chocolate ingredients there. Never think about, or oh, you buy a, a box of chocolate, then put some chocolate in the media. No, it, it's totally different. We should say chocolate-like agar. Chocolate agar using to cultivation fastidious bacteria, which means the bacteria are very picky to grow, such as Neisseria gonorrhea, which is caused gonorrhea, and the Haemophilus influenza, which is caused childhood uh, meningitis. We will mention later on, okay? So this is selected media. Now I'm gonna go into give you some of the example. Let's say Makanki agar. That's a selected media. Because on the Macang, in the Makanki agar, they are biosorts and they are crystal violet, especially this crystal violet, because it has crystal violet. So 
only gram-negative bacteria will grow. Gram-positive bacteria will be died. Remember gram stem, we use crystal violet as a basic dye. It will be attaching to peptide and glycan of bacteria, of gram-positive bacteria. And the gram-positive bacteria have a very heavy peptide and glycan. And the gram-negative bacteria is very thin. So if it's a gram-positive bacteria, the crystal violet will be tracking there, attacking there. So it will be dyed. Remember, all the staining when we do the bacteria on the glass slides, they are dead bacteria already. Okay, so crystal violet is selective for gram-negative bacteria. Now, when you see peptone right here, so this is agar, is a complex agar. And when you see the lactose there, and the neutral rate there, you also should know, depends on bacteria whether they use lactose to do fermentation or not. This is also a differentiated media. So this is tells you a differentiated media, why? Because there is a lactose there. And there is also a pH indicator, which is called a neutral red. So if bacteria using lactose, let's say E. coli, they using lactose, going through lactose fermentation, the colony will show pink color. If some bacteria, let's say Cetomonas, they did not go through lactose fermentation, then the colony should be colorless because the neutral red did not turn pink color. Okay, so because of the lactose, so Makankiyagi is also a differentiated media. So this is now some other examples. Differentiated media based on their biological characteristics will have a different color and morphology on the agar plates. Blood agar, we can we just mentioned it can be differentiated between hemolytic and non-hemolytic. Hemolytic we call it beta hemolytic, and non-hemolytic we call it gamma hemolytic. Now hemolytic we have alpha and beta. Now Makanhi agar based on the lactose fermenter, non-fermenter, we say it's a differentiated media, and I just mentioned. This is a very important slide. We're going to mention this later on. This is an agar, which is showing you blood agar is an enriched media and a differentiated media. Okay, blood agar, because they have 5% she blood. So some of the bacteria use it. If the bacteria is very invasive, they will completely hydrolyze blood cell and the lysis blood cell will causing this transparent zone. This is called a beta hemolytic. A good example, a good example is streptococcus pyogenes. This is a pathogen called strep throat. Now, most of the time during the normal time, you send me an email, say the Dr. Sheng, I'm not gonna go into your lab because I have a strep throat. What is a pathogen called strep throat? Is streptococcus pyogenes cause beta hemolytic on the blood agar. Now the other one, which is the number one ammonium pathogen in the United States, the number one community acquired ammonium in the United States, we call streptococcus ammonium. That is caused partially hydrolysis of blood cell. So we say it's alpha hemolytic. So you see the colony there is dark greenish. Okay, so this is a blood agar. Now, how we can isolation bacteria become a pure culture? We already mentioned Bob Cook um, using agar to do the pure culture isolation, get a single colony. Okay, so here we're gonna talk about is spread plating, strict plating, and the pore plating. Now, be careful what we want to mention. The method to isolation pure culture. We can do spread plating, strict plating, and pore plating, but most of the time we only do strict plating. Spread plating and the pore plating is used to get the exact number of the bacterial colony. So that's called a quantitative test. And the qualitative test we use in strict plating because strict plating we can know the presence, absence of the colonies. So this is strict plating. How we do that, you get a bacterial solution. You use loop, flame the first, then to do a very intensive streak at the beginning. Then you do a less intensive of the second cause. 
more or less intensive for the third chord and then do the fourth and the fifth. Most of the time, we only do four chords, okay? Now, after the plates put at 37 degrees Celsius for 24 hour incubation, you will see all those colonies there. Those colony, which is a group of cell representing a single cell, a single bacteria species. So one individual colony, we say it's a pure culture. Now spread plating, how we do that? Spread plating, we will do a serial dilution using tubes and then add the bacteria onto the agar surface using stereo bent lot, or we, we call it hockey spreader to do the spread. And then the incubation. After incubation, we will use a place which has a countable, acceptable number, 30 to 300 cells there. We also call 30 to 300 CFU, colony forming unit. Now, pore plating, what means the pore plating? Which means we have agar plates. It's empty, the petri dish. Then we add the bacteria there in the solution. Then we add the melted agar. The melted agar, usually it is a little bit hot. It's about 50 degrees Celsius. Then we mix it, and then the agar will be solidified about half an hour in the room temperature. Now be careful for the pore plating because pore plating has a mild heat. So it will kill some of the bacteria. Pore plating most of the time using the food industry to do a quick test. Okay, this is a bacterial colony on the agar plates. This is an example do by the spread plating. Now this is how we're gonna do a spread plating. We will practice in the lab. Uh, if not, I will have a demo show you, and also I will be have some uh, calculation test for you in the lab section. So we just make sure it's easy. Uh, here we do see area dilution, then we spread. Now these two plates. You need to know this plate is acceptable. This plate is not acceptable because this is a one, two, three, four, five. Only five colonies there. It's not acceptable. The reason is it's not within the range of 30 to 300. Another reason is that those five colonies could cause coming from the sporadic con contamination from other places. So we don't use that plates and we will pick the place like that between 30 and 300, okay? Now, something else I want to mention. We do have some of the fashion machine can do a spiral plating. This is a machine. This, uh, this bottle is alcohol, this water. So the, you press the button and the pipelines go there to do the wash first. Then your liquid goes here and this is a negative bump, the vacuum bump. So the negative pressure will let the liquid go inside. Then you go here, it will be dropped onto the plates, then you do the stir, and the plates, the colony will be spread average like a circle. So this is used crystal violet to do an example. And then later on, these plates can put on the automatic counter machine, then we can do the counter, the colony counting, okay? Now be careful, this machine is very expensive, $25,000 for spiral plating. But be careful, this machine can only use for liquid, cannot use for food sample, because the food samples, the food particles will stuck in the pipes there. So that is called spiral plating. But the spiral plating is a good thing is, the spiral plating saves some of the labor work because you do not have to do C area dilution. Um, it will be covered at least the four dilution scales. So that's a good thing for the spiral plating. This is the results of the spiral plating in the older time. We have to compare to the figure. Then we know the approximately colony there. Okay, here is something I want to mention. When we talk about the cock cell, bacillus, okay, all those things, we, lords, we are talking about is cell morphology. Now here what we talk about is colony morphology. Colony morphology, which means a colony, the shape of a colony on the agar. So that could be punctiform, circular, filaments, irregular, could be flat, raised, convex, 
could be the entire undulate, leucolate erodes. These sometimes will be very characteristic for certain bacteria. For example, Neisseria gonorrhea, which is a very flat and pushable colony. So some bacteria do have the characteristics, but be careful here. What we mention is a colony morphology. Is a bacterial cell on the agar plates. But when we mention lords, cock cell, bacillus, or those, those are the bacterial cell on glass slides. It's different. Okay, now what is the message to character to measure microorganisms on the uh, on the plates or how we do the calculation? Now the first thing is easy. When we do the pore plating, spread plating. We count colony counts on the agar plates. The second method is we can use a petrohoff hossi counting chamber. The third method we can use the membrane filtration method. Last, we could do some spectrometer to testing the uh, turbidity. And the last one, if we want to do some quick test, we can see how many ATP generate, how many acid and the gas generate for the bacteria. So let's talk about this. This is a counting chamber, which is called, which is called petrohoff hothi counting chamber. So what happened is you put the bacteria in the, uh, in the holding chamber, then you cover glass slide, they underneath microscope, you're gonna count them. They can be used for both eukaryotic and the prokaryotes. It's easy, quick, inexpensive, but be careful. This method, you not be able to differentiate live and dead cell because everything is on the solution. You're not gonna differentiate that. The second method, this is a color spectrometer because bacteria grow in the blood usually will show turbidity, which is a cloudy. So we will see how turbidity it is for the tubes. Higher turbidity, which means more bacteria cells. So we can see the spectrometer, which means a higher level of absorbance value. So for example, this 0.21 is larger than 0.04, which means bacteria in this tube is higher than that one. But be careful, this method is not gonna be differentiated live and dead cell also. Because even bacteria dead, they still gonna be in the solution showing turbidity. Okay, this is called a, a viable counting methods. This method usually used to testing E. coli and the fecal coliforms in the water. So you know the drinking water system in the United States based on the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency's requirements, you drinking water should be zero tolerance for E. coli and the coliform. Otherwise, it's indicated fecal contamination. So how we do the test? We put a membrane in this funnel, and then we close it. Of course, there is a negative bump there. Then we put a water sample there. This membrane filter is 0.45 micrometer. This size, most of the bacteria will be stuck on the filter membrane surface and not going to be go to the bottom of the water in the bottle, okay? Because it is not gonna be filtered. So then we take this filter and put on the agar plates, we cover the lid, then we do the incubation, we will see the colony there. And this is what exactly looks like. If you see all these type of the colony on the filter, which means this water has been contaminated with fecal coliform and you cannot drink it, what do you have to do? You may have to boil, boil it, is that right? Okay, that's for viable counting methods. Now using the similar membrane filtration method, we can also test in yeast and the modes. Uh, this is called isogrid. So what is the isogrid? This is the bump, there's the pipelines, and this is the funnel is the same thing. So you put a few paper there, the water going through here, then you add the water, in, add the field filter onto the agar, then after incubation, you will see the colony there. There, most of them is the yeast and the modes. So isogrid is a membrane filtration system to testing yeast and the modes. Okay, so that's all I have for this section.
Now, pretty much end up here, we end of this examination one, the slides. So I think about right now is we gonna put the uh, exams on the e-campus about like 50 multiple choice questions, and then you go ahead to do it. I think I'll try to do it's open book, and also you can try at least three times, okay? So that's uh, for the examination one, for the lectures, and I hope you uh, study it, and I'll have a separate email um, if anything happens. So let's do the exam later on, then we move on to the examination two material, talk about the most exciting material, which is about bacteria pathogens. Okay, so let's end up here.